Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Masterclass Workshop Wednesday. I'm Taylor. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the casting director at New York Theatre Workshop. We're broadcasting this class from Zoom and simultaneously live streaming on Facebook Live. We're so happy to have you all with us. I know there are about 76 people tuning in on Zoom, and I'm sure there are more people tuning in on Facebook Live. New York Theatre Workshop has long sought to create art that interrogates our past as a way of understanding the present and shining light toward the future. To that end, we are taking time to recognize the history of the land we occupy in the East Village. And as we find ourselves in the digital space, we'd like to embrace this opportunity to acknowledge the many native lands from which we're all tuning in from. We're posting a link in the chat where you can learn more about the tribal history of the land on which you are situated. We invite everyone to take a moment, input your address into the website and post it into the chat, the native land from which you are joining us. I'm just gonna post this in the chat for everybody. Oh, great. New York Theatre Workshop is situated on the island of Manhattan and we acknowledge the island as the traditional lands of the Munsee Lenape, the Canarsie, Unkachog, Matanacock, Shinnecock, Rakawank, and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. This masterclass is part of New York Theatre Workshop's virtual programming series, which is all free and available to the entire MYTW community, including you. We've asked Maria to share an organization that is meaningful to her. If you are in a position to do so, we hope you would consider making a donation in honor of this class to Equality for Flatbush and also to MYTW to support ongoing programming. You'll find a link to donate to both organizations in the chat on Zoom and in the comments on Facebook Live. In this class, Maria will explore encountering the script for the first time. She will walk us through some exercises with a group of volunteers. The exercises will take around 65 minutes and then we will open up for questions, finishing the class by 3 p.m. the latest. If you have a technical or logistical question about the platform, please share via the Q&A tab vis-a-vis -vis Zoom or comment vis-a-vis -vis Facebook. When we get to the Q&A portion, feel free to share your questions for the panelists via the same mechanism. If you're on Zoom and someone asks a question you're interested in, you can upvote it by clicking the thumbs up. On Facebook, you can use the like feature as well, and we'll do our best to get to all the questions that we can in the time that we have. We're so happy and lucky to have Maria with us today. Maria currently teaches an ongoing scene study class at the Freeman Studio in New York City and beginning acting at Wheaton College, and she is one of my absolute favorite actors. Theater-wise, you may have seen her in Belleville at MITW on the national tour of What the Constitution Means to Me, Annie Baker's Uncle Vanya at Soho Rep, or In the Next Room on Broadway, many, many more theater projects. And some TV and film credits include Emergence, Orange is the New Black, Christine, The Neighbor's Window, and many, many more. Now, please allow me to welcome Maria Dizia. Maria, if you want to pop up, we're all ready for you. I'm popped. Thank you so much. I'm so happy that I'm getting the chance to do this today. I love New York Theatre Workshop so much. It's been we a are. part of my artistic life for a really long time. Um, we are so happy time. to have you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, for a long time as a, uh, as a dreamer and wanting to be an actor. So I wanted to talk, I just want to say that, um, you know, right now I can only see my face. And so it's like being in a little bit of an echo chamber. So I'm going to try to keep my uh, train of thought. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, encountering a script for the first time because I think it's one of those sneakily important things for an actor. Um, one of the things about it is that it is the only time that we get to experience the narrative, not necessarily the play because that's something else, but the only time we get to experience the narrative of the script, the way the audience is going to. And uh, things that we uh, experience while we're reading the script, oh my gosh, I can't believe he said that, I didn't know she was going to do that thing are actually really uh, vital to our importance, uh, to our understanding of the play, understanding the reversals, the, the lies and the truths that might be uh, explored in the play. And we wanna have a, a container, I feel like to hold that for such a long time. Uh, I didn't understand how to uh, keep a sense of that because then we start working on the play and then in, in my experience, you cannot see it again now you are in it and it is impossible to get that perspective again 
Um, in terms of the, the narrative, that, that's one thing about getting from the first time that you read the play, but it's actually uh, not the most important, I think. A lot of times I feel like we read plays or I, I'm just going to use the I, <laughs> I read plays, like I'm taking the script and I'm like shaking it upside down by its ankles. And then like the change falls out of its pockets and I'm like, okay, this is what it is. This is what it wants. And, you know, finding out what it wants from me, finding out maybe right what I want from it, right? There's always uh, some relationship to that. And then I'll go back in after that first kind of mercenary read, right? And then, and then now we're gonna work. Now we're gonna take everything apart and figure out what it is and we're gonna make choices. And I, I find that what happens when I do that is that the script exists here and then the choices exist here. Almost in this, um, arbitrary, they, it, it's hard to, to get away from that feeling that they are arbitrary and adjacent to, to the script. And it feels that the entire process is then trying to, to get those, to put them together. And I started to wonder if there was a way that, that this didn't have to happen. If, if the reading and the interpretation and the discovery of the play could, could happen uh, simultaneously. And actually it is, right? But it, was there a way to, to make that so I was aware of it and, and I could uh, use that in my work? Um, those of you who have uh, worked with me before, I think there are a few of you here, know that I have this really favorite um, video on YouTube that I'll send to Taylor after and uh, Taylor can send it to everyone of Stella Adler talking about this thing and she talks about um, right this here's the script and she says and here's the histrionic actor on the other side and that the theater is in the middle and then she has this really great like flub in it where she's gesturing to the script and she says uh, the script is a skeleton it has no bones you have to decide where the bones go. And I, I really like it, because of course we understand what she's saying, but at the same time, she's also exactly right, that the script is a skeleton and it also has no bones. It, uh, it has words and we have to give it our bones and our feelings and our intellect in order to create the person who lives there. Um, the, the other reason why I think that uh, this is important is about finding a way that we can kind of capture where we live in the script from the beginning is that actors are being asked to work alone more and more. And, and now we really understand that, right? Because here we are, I'm staring at my own face over Zoom, <laughs> trusting that there are other people here that I'm uh, communicating with. And, um, Oh, is there a way for me to not do that? No, right, speaker view, gallery view. Okay, now I'm looking and I, I see Taylor's name. I'm gonna go back to the other thing. And James just wrote, we're here, that's so nice. So, right, so we really understand that now, right? How actors are being asked more and more to work alone. Um, and we understand that when we have auditions and, uh, I think we have a sense of that at the first rehearsal, even three weeks sometimes, right? Feels so truncated. And we certainly feel that before we walk on to a set where sometimes we might not even have a conversation with the director. And, and the reason why I think that is important uh, to think about is because I think that when we're all working together, the choices are being made together and the choices are being validated together. So we might offer something and then it is uh, supported and validated by the people that we're working with, uh, the director, just hearing a sound choice that someone picks, right? Reinforces, I knew that that's what was going on. And when you're working alone, you, there, you don't have that consensus. You, um, so you really are finding your way into a script. And then I think the confidence that actors get through that consensus, you, we want to find a way to, to get to that confidence on our own. And I think that, so I'm going to share uh, this first exercise with you now, which is one of the ways that I feel that we can read a script for the first time and understand where we live in it. And it's a, it's a place to, it, it gives us a really fertile place to start 
rather than a place of um, here is this uh, uh, of reading a play and then having an imaginary play in our mind that we're now going to slowly try to walk towards and make real. Instead, that imaginary play is never going to happen. We're, the play is going to happen right here. So let's have uh, Porva and Leon, if you could join me. Hi. 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 Um, oh, wonderful. I'm so glad I just found out that we're all joined together. Beautiful. So if you can pull up the script that I gave you, which is animals out of paper. Leon, and I think that it should be, you, you might have something from Taylor. Yeah, I got be a good little widow. Oh, oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Very good. Excellent. <laughs> I wrote the wrong. Okay. So can we actually have Hanji? All right. Yeah, no, I was Wonderful. literally about to say that was, that was. <laughs> right. Totally. You're like, um, <laughs> okay. Beautiful. So can you call up the script and have it, uh, you know, put it somewhere where you can both see your scene partner. And what I'm going to ask you to do actually is to hide self view. So, you're not in that um, echo chamber of looking at your own face and you're just going to see your partner's face. And then what I want to do with the script is one of two things. You can either uh, take the, take a piece of paper and fold it in half and cover all the other lines. So you're only seeing the first line, or you can put the document at the bottom of the page so that you're scrolling up to find each new line, right? So that you can only see one line at the bottom of the page. So let me know when. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, great, so now here's what we're gonna do. Sometimes this is, uh, it's a little harder to explain sometimes actually because it's so simple and you'll find that it's actually simple to do and then we're going to go through it together. So just bear with me while I try to uh, lay this out. So did either of you have a chance to read the, um, the Guskin that I sent? Yeah, yeah. great. So right in it, he talks about, so what we're going to be doing is this Guskin read. So in it, he talks about glancing down at the line getting as much as you need, looking at your partner and saying it to your partner as the first time so that we don't have, we're not buried in the thing and we're not looking ahead. And um, after he published this book and was still continuing to work with people for a while, um, Harold added this other, other um, aspect to the read, which I found especially really helpful, which is to say how you are feeling before the line then to look down, see what your line is, and to allow what it is that you're feeling, right? That kind of what you are feeling and then what the line, the information the line is giving you to then allow those things to have some alchemy and uh, to deliver it to the other person. Um, when you're saying how you're feeling before the line, you can do one of three things. You can say, I'm feeling, and, and you don't have to worry about Mad Libs in any way. You, you don't have to find the perfect word for what it is. You want to, the idea is capturing the impulse of what's going on inside, inside of you and giving it a voice, right? Not feeling like whatever it is that's happening inside of you needs to be squashed in service of what it looks like maybe this line wants to be, right? So we're trying, so that's a way to first get this thing out. Um, so you can say, you know, I'm feeling, ah, uh, I can feel my heart fluttering a little bit. I'm feeling kind of anxious and allow that to inform the line. So, so you can express it that way. You can say, and allow that to inform the line, right? That being just as articulate in terms of experience as forcing yourself to say, I am feeling blank. Or you can, you know, once we get into the back and forth between the two characters, you can say, like, what is that supposed to mean? 
right? You can have some, you can have this uh, articulation of uh, a thought feeling before you say the actual line, being like, I, I, you know, who, I, I can't believe that you're speaking to me that way. And then look at your line and then you're going to find out what it is, right? And allow the, and what we're going to work on together is, is allowing what it is that we're feeling in the moment to inform what it is that we're saying and trusting that the lines are working on us in their own way and that we do not have to double down and, uh, you know, in a way, like I, I think of it as like, we don't have to bridle ourselves to the line in a way, right? If, if we're uh, a horse, I guess, in this metaphor, you know, and we don't have to bridle ourselves to it and to pull the line along, that actually it's a, it can be a much more gentle relationship and that the line is gonna coax us where it wants to go. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go away, but then I'm gonna keep popping up to have conversations with you. So, um, you both have hidden your self view. Yes. So you only see one another. Okay, beautiful. So I'll go away. And I think Porva, you, you begin. Yes. As Ilana. Yeah. And so I start with a feeling. Yeah. And, down, and, and then up and say the line up. Yeah. And then say the line, allowing whatever it is that you have discovered in yourself right, to inform where you're coming from, from the line, you know, especially because you don't have no idea what's going on yet. So what else is there to do except to, right, inhabit where you are? So since you have the first line, you have, um, you know, as we go on, the lines will inform the way we're feeling kind of little by little, you know, um, but right now you can start from where you are you know, of whatever it is that's going on with you to give it some expression and then say the line and I'm gonna go away. I'm feeling caffeinated. Mm -hmm. I've got Suresh writing me poems. And I've got you writing about my book. Yeah, beautiful. And so I just want to encourage you even more, Porva. And you know what happens is that, you know, sometimes we'll say something and then now in this next moment, you might not feel that anymore. So you don't have to feel any, no, I was just going to say, you don't have to feel any need to say you feel caffeinated again. But what I want to ask you to do is, right, because now maybe you feel something else. What I want to ask you to do is if you find, right, all those things that go along with feeling caffeinated, I, wa I want us to um, allow that and to go right into the line without giving ourselves time to collect our thoughts in a way. Does that make sense? And then just to start doing the thing with, which might feel like throwing, throwing off a cliff and might feel rudderless, um, but in, in a way that that might be the feeling that will, will serve us later on. All right, so let's just start again. And now where, whatever it is, do you have a question? Well, just like I'm only catching a few words. Yeah. And so between every phrase, I should say my feeling again. Well, actually in this, well, in, in this way, you can allow the way that we're working now and because you have the lines up here, right? And not down there, you can allow yourself to take that thing and see and send it into the line and then see what happens. Maybe it'll transform while you're speaking, but that's okay. You don't have to tell us. We just want, we, we want to hear where you're coming from to incite. Does that make sense? So you can bring yourself and bring the truth of what it is that you're experiencing into the line and then let the line and then let life happen. However it is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah, beautiful. I'm feeling excited. I've got Suresh writing me poems, and I've got you writing about my book and my scaled koi and the 
stupid dress I wore at the convention last summer. I'm feeling calm. What? I'm feeling, um, wondering what's next. Yeah. Your blessings, your counted blessings. I'm feeling curious. Your, your dress? I didn't read you that one, that one about your dress. I'm feeling Wait, what about my dress? Right. I'm feeling... Oh, um... Did you read this? I'm feeling panicky. Your book? Well, I, I mean... I'm also feeling a little panicky. <laughs> um, uh, you, you read my book? I'm feeling uh, breathless. You left it here. <laughs> I'm feeling lost. Um, you, you read this. I'm feeling, I don't know. Uh, oh, it's still your line. You don't, you, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling still lost. You don't just read somebody's book. I'm feeling like maybe I'm in trouble. I read it, Andy, but can you just listen to me? I'm feeling like I'm the one in trouble now. Um, it, it's private. It, it's a very private thing. I feel like yeah, beautiful. And can you allow, right? So I, I, can, can you allow Hanji, just when you're saying, I feel like I'm the one in trouble now, right? Can you allow whatever that feeling is, right? It, it felt a little bit like it went from, uh, I feel like I'm the one in trouble now to, uh, to a, a defensive, right place but i wonder can we live in just i feel i'm the one in in trouble now right and then see if it transforms while we're speaking but let's see if we could bring that into the line so uh so can we just go back uh porva to the line that you had before just where we were yeah yeah and and, and i'd like you to just again say say however however it is that you're feeling now now that we've stopped for a second no need to to get back on the train you know to start now from from where you are now that we've stopped and whatever is going on with you okay so i'm sorry i don't really know where it's hanji we were at um maybe you left it here you left it here should we take it from there yes let's do that lovely okay um I'm feeling, feeling cool. <laughs> you left it here. I'm feeling a little bit more relaxed. You read this? You don't just read somebody's book. I'm feeling a little defensive. I read it, Andy, but can you just listen to me? I'm feeling like you're about to accuse me of something. It's private and it's a, it's a very private thing. I feel like I am gonna accuse you of something. You took it out. You read to me from it. I'm feeling select entries. I'm feeling upset. It was just sitting there and I 
picked it up and I, you know, I started flipping through it. I'm feeling, feeling guilty. You might have gotten the idea that these things might be slightly personal. You might have stopped reading. I mean, there's other stuff in here. I'm, I'm feeling pissed off. I shouldn't have read it. Andy, I shouldn't have read it. I'm sorry. But I started and I couldn't put it down. I feel... Like you, I, I feel like you've insulted me. Look, for a long time, Alana, I, I really, I took your class on the scaled koi, koi last summer at the convention and you, you were wearing this green dress, this green summer dress. And that's why I couldn't fold the koi. I was just watching you fold and, and talk and, and walk around and I really like you. I, I, I mean, I have a really big crush on you. I feel like you're bullshitting me. I know it was in the book. I feel like, I feel really pissed off. Oh, man. I feel like you don't have a right to be pissed off. You need to tell me something. I read your book. I read it twice. Andy, there is something you need to tell me. I feel... I feel like you want to say something, okay? I feel like I am in the right here. You always write as one of your blessings. You always write, I've never been hurt. I feel, I feel like you're accusing me of something. So? I feel like you're an asshole. <laughs> you write about it 25 times or more throughout the book. I've never been hurt. Not really. And I feel like you're really crossing the line now. I haven't. I feel like that's so fucked up. And then, you know, this book is just filled with, it's filled with pain. All these really awful and tough things that have happened to you. I mean, your parents, your sister, the time you tried stand-up comedy. I feel like, like you're mocking me. But I really wish you hadn't read this. I feel, I don't know. So, can you just tell me how you can be thankful for these things? I feel like you want me to explain something to you. I don't know. I feel like now our work can begin. So, I mean, what is a blessing anyhow? 
anything? Can it be anything? Well, I feel, I feel hopeful. Um, I, I don't know what they are. They're, they're my feelings. I, I think about, I think about them and I write them down. It's just what I do. And, and, and I've been hurt once. I hurt my elbow. I feel really overwhelmed by that information. <laughs> Pain isn't a blessing unless you're totally crazy. It's not something you sit around being thankful for. It just isn't. Uh, I, I still feel hopeful. I, I, I don't know, it, it, it might be, it, it's not pleasant, but it's real. Anyhow, it, it's just my book, it's just stuff I write. I, I don't expect you to understand, nobody understands me. I feel like I'm starting to understand. I feel like, oh, actually, yes, I, that, I feel like I just missed something. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah. And I forget, is that where, is That's that, where, a, where, right? That is our last part. Pardon? I know, and then they kiss. It's so crazy no, the scene ends that way. Huh? And then he goes towards her and kisses her longer. Yes, that's right. I really enjoyed watching both of you so much. I want to talk about it later. I want to make sure that we have enough time and we'll do the, I want to do the other scene. But I just want to talk, I, you know, I want to find out what you, um, what your experience was of doing that. I, I enjoyed watching it so much, you know, and, and, and I enjoyed watching, you know, just starting from this place of trying to be truthful with where we are and then going along for this ride and sometimes having right that beautiful uh uh synchron uh has synchronic i don't know what the word is let's just call it that a synchronic experience of expressing something looking down and seeing that the line is exactly in concert with what it is that you're feeling and then having what i think is just as valuable and rich in experience is feeling something very deeply looking down at the line and finding that it is in conflict with what you're about to say and i think two things about that i think one it allows us to see the character so clearly all of a sudden be like oh i was here and she's here right that's a clarity i think so early on that i think is really valuable for us as actors to, you know to understand that already rather than in, in a mess of other things, trying to figure out where are we together? Where are we apart? What are the things I'm going to have to build to be like her? On the other hand, right? So that's, that's one, you know, uh, thing that can come of that, I think is a real clarity about who the person is. Um, but the other thing that we could have is sometimes that, um, that other place that we are coming from adds a richness and a depth to what that person is saying. You know, that maybe they were feeling, you know, that, that maybe it, um, it makes them three-dimensional to, to be experiencing what you were feeling and then to change their expression on a dime and decide that's not what I'm going to say. That, that's not, you right, that's not the emotional thing that I want. Uh, I don't want that to become a part of my relationship with him right now. I actually want to try to say this other thing and see where that goes. Um, and then I also like, uh, what, what I like about this exercise and we'll do the other, we'll see the other one is that I felt so many times that I encountered acting exercises and then I couldn't figure out how I was supposed to take the lesson that I learned from that exercise and then bring it into my work. I find it really hard. But what I like about this is that it works with the text immediately. It's already showing me how I can um, 
if I can occupy this place of really staying in the present and really trusting that if I uh, pay attention to myself, that it will serve me and that paying attention to myself is not going to make me fixed and well, I'm just going to be this the whole time, that actually paying attention to myself allows me to be supple and to move and to be, um, and to allow emotions to flow through me. The way as if sometimes if we start a scene and we feel like we're not in the place that the scene wants to start, we'll then suppress that feeling, put something else on top of it. And then actually that suppression makes that feeling persist throughout the entire scene. And so the whole scene is a fight of trying to do that other thing. Um, and so when Guskin talks about this, interesting, he doesn't talk about it as just a way to read for the first time. He suggests that it's a way to work constantly, that this is how every time you're, you know, you go into, you, when you go home, when you're not in rehearsal, this is what you're doing. And you're constantly, uh, and the, the idea in which it's building that muscle so that when we are working, when we actually, when we're in the performance or when we're working on set on the day, this is still what we're doing. We're not ever trying to copy some other thing that went beautifully well before because we rehearsed it so many times, we just trust, well, I could do it. It happened all those other times. And so I can do it now. And so if I feel like the camera's in my face and I'm, you know, and I feel, a little more out of my body than I want to, that the best thing for me to do in that moment is to acknowledge it and allow it to inform the way that I'm speaking so that it can be transformed by the interactions by the other actor and by the language of the play. But I can't wait to, to talk to you about it after. Thank you so much. That was very beautiful work. Thank you. So Thank now, you. Um, let's do Be a Good Little Widow. And that is Leon and Victoria. So we're going to do the same thing. So put the script wherever you want to. You put it up and you can cover it or you can. Tell me when it feels good. Um, I feel anxious. You shouldn't be here. You know, and I want to allow you, Victoria, that's such a beautiful thing, right? <laughs> I think that most of my scenes begin that way. And I want to allow you, uh, I, or I want to ask you to, if you can allow it to have an expression also. Does that make sense? Yes. That right now we're anxious, and I'm wondering if you can allow it to have a, a, a movement in some way that feels good to you, whatever it is that you're body wants to do okay. all right and now you might not be anxious anymore so <laughs> whatever it is you're feeling now give expression and a body to that okay uh... Uh, I st still feel nervous <laughs> um, you shouldn't be here I feel keen you called me. Uh, I feel a little relaxed. Uh, I did. <laughs> I feel keen still. Yeah. I feel like you're lying. What did I say? I feel confused. Come over. Beautiful. And that's something that you can allow, Leon, that you can allow, right? You said you feel confused, which is a valid, great, my other favorite place to come from is I don't know. And uh, you can allow the confusion to, to inform the come over. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Right, rather than to bungee out of it. But again, you might not be feeling confused anymore. So mm -hmm. wherever you're coming from now, uh, just tell us where and then and say your line. I feel grounded. Come over. 
I feel thirsty. I'm awesome. <laughs> I feel happy. I rode my bike over. I haven't ridden my bike in forever. I was like, I need to ride my bike right now. Uh, um, I feel a little uh, kind of goofy. Uh, I, I had a bike. I miss my bike. I left it in Colorado. I feel, yes. These last few days have felt like years. I want to take a shit and I was like, why? I don't know what to do with myself. Um, I still feel a little goofy. Uh, you're, you're not allowed to be sad because no one is sad as me. I'm the widow. I feel confused. You're sad. Um, Um, I feel content. Say I'm sadder than you. Yeah, well, you know what, Victoria, it even feels like that maybe you had this hiccup, right? Where you started mm -hmm. to like, <laughs> and you can have that. Okay, okay, cool. Okay. Right, you can do that, that can be, that, that can, you don't have to override, I don't want you to override anything that feels wrong, you know, and then try to correct it. And, mm -hmm. you know, and shape it to have the thing. You can, like, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> I feel like I'm all the way in left field. D -d -d let, that, Take let that go in. So, okay. again, wherever it is that you're coming from now. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> say I'm sadder than you. I feel tingly you're sadder uh i feel obnoxious do i look like a widow yeah i feel <laughs> i'm surprised um i'm really good at it i know all the rules like the one about how you're you probably shouldn't be here right now I feel worried. I shouldn't have ridden over. I've been drinking. I almost hit a pole coming over. I almost died. My mind isn't right. I should probably just stay here. Um, I'm a little concerned. You can stay, but don't fucking touch me or I'll scream. Yeah, so I, lovely. So I, I just want to add uh, uh, one other thought to it. Leon, I'm wondering, there's a... Can you talk to uh, Victoria a little more, you know, mm -hmm. that feel that right, that the conversation is just happening between the two of you so that you can just talk to Victoria. So for instance, when you just said you were worried, right, that you can allow that feeling of however worry manifests in you to allow that to inform the way you talk just to Victoria, who's right here. There's this great um, phrase of talk to the actor, not the character, which is one of my uh, favorite things that I like write on my scripts all the time to remind myself. Uh, so can we go back? And again, if you're not feeling worried anymore, that's fine. I just want to know. I like where you are, right? This is very interesting. I, I want to ask you to come from wherever this is right now. I feel like this is very mm. sincere and lovely, so I don't know if, what is that? It can be annoyed with me. <laughs> um, I, I feel like a, like a sigh. Mm. I shouldn't have ridden over. I've been drinking. I almost hit a pole coming over. I almost died. My mind isn't right. I should probably just stay here. Um, I'm feeling worried. Uh, you, you can stay, but don't fucking touch me or, or I'll scream. I feel, um, okay. Okay. I, uh, 
uh, I feel confused. Uh, <laughs> uh, I saw the crash, and I went. I went and saw it. I feel curious. Are you serious? You shouldn't have seen that shit. I feel like I'm lying. I I did. I feel like you're lying. Why'd you do it? I don't know. I I I needed to. I feel. I feel. Yeah, you know, part of your process. What was it like? Uh, feel anxious. It was awful. Um, I feel just curious. Like what? Uh, feel like I don't. <laughs> to talk anymore about it, but like a massacre and a... and allow yourself. That's such a beautiful thing that you just expressed that you feel like you don't want to talk about it anymore, you know, and so allow yourself to, uh, you know, don't force yourself to say it just because the line is there, you know, allow yourself to have that feeling and negotiate that with the line. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like a massacre. Uh, and this smell. You ever wonder what a dead body looks like? Look, what a dead body smells like? I feel grossed out, yes. Yeah, and Leon, I just want to ask you, right? You feel grossed out, right? Do you, do you really feel grossed out or do you feel like you should feel grossed out? Mm. Because that's okay. Because you can say, that's one of my favorite things. You could say, I feel like I'm supposed to feel grossed out. <laughs> Which is a very freeing thing, right? I feel like I'm supposed to feel grossed out. You know. I, I feel like I'm having trouble because then I try to look for like, a, you said not to, but I'm looking for like yeah. the right word. Yeah, you don't have to. I think you're doing a nice job. I feel like sometimes you're saying like, right. Right. And I think that that's nice. I think that that's great. This is your first time going through it. Uh, so let's see. Let's see if you could start, you know, have you ever thought about what a dead body smells like? And uh, I just want you to think about it and see if you could give it a name and then allow that to inform the way you're saying the line. You know? um, I, I feel, I feel sure, yes. Um. I feel grossed out. Um, it smells like animals, like um, a petting zoo, maybe, but with fire and blood. Beautiful. And that's the end of that, right? Of that. That's such a huge ride that they go on, right? It's so. Wonderful. I find it especially freeing in something like this. You know, both characters are um, are drunk in this scene, right? But I, we, we don't have to, uh, the, the drunkenness, right, in, in a lot of ways gets expressed through where they're going, right? And, and, in, and in just responding truthfully, right, to the ludicrousness of what's going on, it's there. And you end up getting to the, the, the play, right, kind of so, right, sobers you up a little bit. You don't have to, right? You don't have to do this other thing to make sure you're going to end up where you're supposed to go. You know, in another time, you might end up somewhere else, right? There's this great idea that the play's going to happen no matter what. The lines are written, you know? And the, the only thing that we have to do, the only, it's very easier said than done, but the only thing that we have to do as the actors is just be truthful in the moment, 
right? That in some ways, if we could just get into that place where we are in relationship to our own truth, that that's all the play wants from us. The, the play was already written. They already figured out all the words and the, the story is going to happen. And what we want to see is someone who's behaving truthfully in the moment and doing that. That was really nice work from both of you. That was really lovely. Thank you. Okay, so now everybody come back or every all the... Um, Porva, you're going to work with us, right? And then we're going to have the people. Let me look at what time it is. Yeah, right. We're going to figure this out. We might do, Taylor, we might do some songs uh, a little shorter. Okay. Great. If you want to send me the where to stop or just verbally. Okay. You know what I think that maybe like, I mean, maybe we'll do it really easy. I think maybe we'll just do like two minutes of each song. Great. Does that? Oh, there, you're right there. Okay. Lovely. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to do this Lindy Davies exercise that I really love that um, that the 10 people have. Oh, so Victoria, you don't have to worry. I, so I thought I saw your eyes just. So I think, who are our participants for this? Maybe Taylor, you can help me. Yeah, I'm going to pop on really quick. So Porva, I think you can hop off and then no, Ricardo right. will have you hop on. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to, but I won't let my camera start. Hmm. Okay. Um, here, I will, Ricardo, I'll chat you separately while Maria maybe tells everybody else which scenes are, or I can help with the scenes too while right. I chat. Okay, great. So the first thing that we're going to do before we get into the scene is that we're going to move around. And I really want to invite everybody who is here, even if you have your uh, camera off, I want you to uh, move around and just see what this feels like in your own body, okay? So I will ask um, the people who participated in our first section to uh, stop your video and so that we just have the 10 people, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then me. I still feel like we're missing someone. Um, so maybe Taylor, you can help me. Let's see. Hold on one second. I'm just reading through this, this chat. Isabella. Um, so what I'd like to do while Taylor is reading through the chat is I, oh, Roberta. Let's see. That's who it is that we're missing. I remember because I was thinking that I might ask her to take her headset off. Great. It, move around. it looks like Roberta may just be standing by. So maybe Porva, can we call on you again and okay. have you jump in as Erica? Yay. All right, beautiful. So what I'd like you to do is see, if, I want you to stand up and, and see, is it like James, you have that thing behind you. So maybe you wanna move your camera somewhere where you feel like you can, there, you can stand away from the thing. You can be close to it. You could be over here, right? We're gonna move around a little bit. All right, so the first thing that I want everybody to do is I want you to find a place that you want to stand in the room in relationship we're going to try in our 3d world to have a relationship with this 2d thing so you can not be on camera if that's what you want you can have your back to the camera I want you to stand someplace where you feel that feels good for you all right now when you found yourself Somewhere that feels good, lovely. Now we can do two things. You can walk or you can stop. And again, sorry, Maria, I'm interrupting you really quick. Um, <laughs> Roberta does want to join us. It's just having a little issue with the camera, which we're gonna fix. So Porva, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you to jump off again Thank you. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. But again, I just want to invite everybody who's not on camera that you can also do this if you would like to see what experience you have. We're just, we just have these 10 people that we're seeing just because it would be too chaotic to see everybody at the same um, time. Well, actually, as I say that, I think we've lost Roberta. Okay. So let's have Porva come oh, Let's just have 11 people. And so right. if Roberta comes, she comes and she does Great. Okay. Porva, thank you. Okay, lovely. So now you can walk or you can stop. 
All right, those are the things. You walk when you want and stop when you want. I want you to see also if you can, because we're, we're going to try to merge these two worlds, the 3D and the 2D world. So you can look at the computer, you know, and see. And if you seeing someone else move gives you the impulse to move or seeing someone move gives you the impulse to stop. I want you to feel that you're doing what you want to do. Okay, lovely. Now we're, we're going to add to that that you can run. You can run backwards, you can run forwards, you can walk, and you can stop. Those are all the things that you can do. Right, and see if you can also continue to have some relationship with this with this screen. Yeah, nice. All right, now we're going to add another thing. Now you can throw yourself on the ground or collapse, right? You can walk, you can walk backwards, forwards, you can stop, you can run, and you can sink to the ground or collapse, throw yourself to the ground. Okay, now the last thing that we're going to add is now you can interact with other people, right? You can try to come to the screen and see. The interaction can be, um, what is that word? The, what is that called when you're looking? With the V. What's that word with the V? I can't think. You can be spying. That's what I'm trying to say. You can spy on somebody or you could try to enlist them. And, and work together. Voyeuristic is the word. It can be voyeuristic. <laughs> All right. And then if someone, if you feel like someone's trying to get your attention and play with you and you don't want to play, you don't have to play. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. And if you're trying to engage with someone and it seems like they're not engaging with you, that's okay. You can continue to do that thing and you can just Respond and allow yourself to have that feeling of what does it feel like to not be played with. And that's just as valid and interesting and fertile a place to come from as having your offer be accepted. All right, now you can do all of these things. And Taylor, could you play our music? And we'll have two minutes of each song. And now you're going to have this um, music, and now the music is going to be another thing. Yes. Give me one second. Yeah. So just keep, as they say, doing what you're doing. Starting with the guide, Maria? Yeah. Okay, great.
Okay, beautiful. I want you to stay in the place where you are. I don't want you to stop in any way. You can stay on the floor where you are. So then we're just going to have one other little piece of music. And what I'd like you to do is see if you can, some of you started already, which I'm uh, so happy about. I, I want you to start to engage with the actual physical computer itself and then allow yourself to feel, right, that the computer is a part of you. Okay, so it's not, rather than going to the thing with a kind of uh, curiosity of what is this thing and what are the things I can do with it, I want you to feel that you can join and become and that the computer is a part of you, all right? In whatever, whatever way that means, I want you to see if you and the computer can become one thing. Taylor, can you start our last track? Yes. And you're still doing all the other things. You can run, walk, stop, throw yourself on the ground. Okay, beautiful. So now what we're going to do is uh, I want you to pin the video of your partner, okay? So that when you're doing this, we're doing this next part, you are only going to see your partner. So that means Isabella and James are going to pin one another. All right, so it's the only person that you see, Kate and Roberta, are going to pin one another. Oh, and uh, per Porva, Porva, Kate and Porva, thank you, thank you so much. Kamara and Julia are going to pin one another. Sam and Ricardo are going to pin one another. Kathleen and Bianca are going to pin one another. Let me know when you've done it because I can still see you even though you can only see your person. All right, beautiful, now. So now with the same vocabulary that we just had, you can walk forward, you can walk backwards, you can stop, you can throw yourself on the ground, you can run, you can interact with this two-dimensional thing. 
I want you to move only on your, I, I only on your line, okay? So you'll only move on your line, whatever expression that it is, the end of your line, right? You can stop. Then I'll pause, then I'll say the other person's line, then it's their turn to move, all right? Just so that our back and forth has a little bit of clarity to it, right? And so that we can see and, and feel one another. All right, and I am going to read this to you, all right? And now like you were responding with the music, now you're going to be responding to your own impulses and to this language. The hallway, outside an apartment. Vicky stands in the doorway. The thing is, soulmates, an idea that may or may not exist. I mean, I'm trying not to over-intellectualize, but you only live once. And so marriage, it's not really an outdated institution. Okay, it's not legal for us, but I mean you could claim that in some parts of the world where we don't live, you could say that and it would be true over there, but here you could say that marriage is an idea that is outdated because so many marriages end in divorce, but actually it's a ritual of commitment or perhaps a ritual of delusion that concludes with betrayal and broken hearts, but Let's pause for one second. I think we lost Maria. Well, this doesn't happen in a normal class, does it? I haven't learned quite how to disappear from rooms in the, the physical world. I'm working on it. Sorry, everybody, just hold on for one second while we try and figure this out. Hi, I got bumped off of my, can you hear me now? Are you able to hear me, Taylor? Yeah, now we can hear you. Okay, I got bumped off. I got ejected. I know. I got. I, I didn't know how to find you in this situation. Okay. okay, I'm leaving. All right, beautiful. Okay, so here I, I want to start with. I'm sure 
the thing that I also like about Lindy's work is that there is no spell, right? So we can start again. Uh, I don't want to start at the beginning. I'm going to start with Erica, will you marry me? Okay. And so we'll start because I just want us to have a sense of feeling our way. All right. Beautiful. Will you marry me? What? No, you. This is grief. You should. I am. I'm grieving. And you're not. You're proposing. I'm so happy to be here. You're experiencing loss. This is, this is delusion. I don't know what this is. We've been together for a long time. Not that long. Depends on how you look at it. I broke up with you. We've been together for a while and we should. Oh my God, how is your mother taking it? Not good, not good. You should be with her. Get on a plane, get on a plane right now and go be with your mother. That's what she, you need. Come with me. What? No, I can't. You can't. It's just not a good time. The doctor said it'll be quick. You'll be back soon. I'm going skydiving. I can't go with you. What? I'm going skydiving. I heard you. Why? I've always wanted to, and you never. You've never asked. And I just decided, screw it. I'm sick of waiting for, so I'm going, and, and so there. Can you postpone? No, Erica, I'm going skydiving. This is just another one of your. You want me there, not because of me. Oh my God, you're so. What am I saying? Your father's dying. Your dad's dying. Okay. Okay, okay, I'll go. No, don't go. I just said I'd go. People die, it's part of life, dying. Erica, you don't have to go. Yeah, I'll go.
And there we are. That's the end of our excerpt. Uh, so I'd, I'd love to tell, you know, Taylor, I feel like now I'd love to like open it. There's just a couple other things I want to say just to like uh, give that, um, just give what we just did like a little bit of context. But then I'd also love for people to ask questions and stuff like that. So you know, what I just wanted to say is that the, the, you know, the quote that we have for the, the title of today is from a Walt Whitman song of myself. And, um, you know, the more I've looked for inspiration and, and stuff in acting, the more I, I've just found so many things in Walt Whitman that I, I feel like are such great mantras for actors. And, and one of them is another quote from the song of myself. The soul is not more than the body and the body is not more than the soul. And, you know, reading other um, parts you know so on, on one hand you, you read that and and he he's saying that there's an equivalence right that the body is not more important than the soul and the soul is not more important than the body but when you read other like uh, so, um uh the electric um uh saying the body electric you know that in there he is saying he has this big long list of you know hips and lips and and bellies and things and he says oh are these things uh not just the poetic body they are the soul oh i say they are the soul and so i think there's another way to read that quote which is to say that he's also saying the soul is nothing more than the body and the body is nothing more than the soul and i think that that couldn't Obviously, that's true. I, I believe that that's true for us as people, but it couldn't be any more true, I think, than for us as actors. And that what's so hard for us as actors sometimes is that our, our work is in this very socialized environment, right? We're like in the kitchen, we're in the, we're sitting on chairs. Um, theater allows for us to have that kind of expression a little more, right? To throw ourselves off of the sofa you know to jump on it to push the chair over to collapse onto the ground you know and obviously film does allow for that but there's so often that we're asked to do things where we're sitting in the chair you know and our soul has this enormous huge thing that goes through it and it can be so hard i found myself a lot of the time uh, just like constantly taking my temperature and feeling that nothing i felt was big enough to to take over this body that it was just so stuck in the chair and in this smallness and what i love about this work is that i think that similarly to the guskin that i just shared with you this lindy davies exercise is not just an exercise that it's a way to work that you get the script for the first time and you have a friend come over and they read the script and you move around because what we all know is that our bodies retain experiences and so that even if you're going to be doing this scene and you're sitting in a chair, that your body had the experience of throwing itself on the ground when it heard those words. Or when you think about expressing those words and you remember jumping up and down and jumping up and down, that it is a way to... Um, it is a way to capture that feeling and have it live in your body so that when you're sitting in the chair when you're standing in a space that you've never stood in before and pretending that it's your home, that you have this visceral memory of this life coursing through you. Um, so I think that's one way that it helps uh, because experiences that we have are so present. And we know that from our own experience, right? For better or for worse, things that we do live in our bodies. But I also think that it opens us up to that there's a lot of possibility that sometimes we feel that we're in this place and it is, I don't have the right to move. I, sometimes it feels like only if I feel the thing very strongly am I allowed to then do something physical that's as equally big, right? That we want to have this thing kind of leading the way. But once we've broken that apart and if our really early, early interaction with the script was doing this and not sitting on the couch and reading it and trying to have thoughts about it, but if our very early thing was doing that, we've broken that membrane for ourselves. That it's already like, you can do that. You can do that. You can do those things. And then you can find yourself on the day with people that you've never met before saying, fuck it. 
<laughs> you know, and then I know, and I will say that something so beautiful, I think about working in this way is that even the, just the feeling of saying to yourself, fuck it, I'm going to throw myself on the floor this time, or I'm going to sit on the table instead of sitting on the chair, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but sometimes it, right? I think those things do feel like a very big deal <laughs> suddenly when you're in rehearsal or on the set for the first time. And no one has said that you can sit on the table. That actually just the act of doing that is incredibly freeing. And it feels so anarchic and beautiful and your soul can follow you, right? Because your soul is your body. And because your body did that, the soul is going to follow. And I, I just encourage you to, um, to include that in, in, in the way you work and to try those things little by little. And, um, you know, if embarrassment is the early response that you have, embarrassment is a beautiful, fertile place to work from. There's a, you got a lot going on when you're embarrassed. Um, and I think that it's, uh, and embarrassment is also, you get a lot closer to people faster, you know? And I, I think that it actually, you'll find that it's a great way. I'm going to send you two things. People know that are my favorite. I'll send them to Taylor and, and she could send them um, to everyone, which is that, that Stella Adler clip that I was telling you all about. And then I want to show you this clip of uh, Jack Nicholson getting ready to uh, break down the door in The Shining in terms of he was wielding an actual ax and he didn't seem to have uh, any trouble preparing <laughs> before he did it. So I want you to think, look, I'm not carrying an ax, so I'm going to do whatever I want. Uh, all right. So let's see. What do I do, Taylor? Do I go, okay, based on the reading you send us, can you talk about balancing an actor's in instinct with information or the environment that informs the character. How do you marry both these things and have an authentic performance? So what I think is that I don't think that you have to be responsible for the environment. I think the environment is going to impose itself on you and that your responsibility is to come from a truthful place of where you're feeling, right? To not try to not have an impulse and then try to stop yourself and package it so it sounds the way you want it to, to allow yourself to ride impulses and to let things out and then let the environment tell you whether that is going to be accepted or it's going to be shunned. And that's such a scary thing for an actor to do. But I, I believe that we learn a lot more. You learn a lot more faster and maybe that's the way the scene works. Does that make sense? Maybe the, the nun doesn't have to, she doesn't have to be the monastery, she doesn't have to be the convent. She just has to be the nun. And the convent is going to impose itself. The other actors are gonna do their thing. You're going to maybe be extra loud and you will hear your voice echo off of the polished floor and maybe you don't like it. And the next time you say your line, it's gonna quiet right? But that tells me a lot more about this person and is more interesting to me than the person who's like, I'm in a quiet convent, I should be quiet, right? I'm learning a lot more. Is there any questions? Was that my one question? I like that. What it was? Yes. Yeah, we have sort of a related one, which I think you just uh, touched on, which is like, can you elaborate more on when our actor selves find something funny in the moment, but the characters seemingly wouldn't find the event? Yes, good? I love that question. I love that question so much because I learned from Harold. Harold was like, it is a blessing to laugh. If you are laughing, that means that you're in the present. And there, it, laugh, laugh and move through it and be embarrassed and whatever comes out of it. And, and keep going um, because we all know what happens when you're on stage and you stifle the laugh. I mean, it just grows, it, it, it doesn't. And what you are doing, not only, so we already know you're laughing and now you're stifling the little bit of life that you have blossoming inside you. <laughs> so allow yourself to laugh and to, to keep going and, and talk through the laugh and maybe you'll find something gorgeous and freeing or maniacal and terrifying, you know, on, on the other side of it. And, um, you know, I had an experience where even after working with Harold and he was like, 
laugh. That is it. That's the beginning of entering the present is, is laughing, right? In some ways, it's the un, you're laughing at the uncanny. Like, I'm here. I'm here. I'm pretending and I'm believing it. And we're laughing, you know. Um, and, you know, even after I worked with him, I had an experience where I was on a set and we're all supposed to be looking and this woman is unraveling. And I started to laugh and I said to myself, this is not the appropriate response to someone who is unraveling. I'm supposed to be looking at her with empathy and concern. And because I, I was er earlier in my experiences being on set, I uh, squashed it. I squashed it. And... I, I did, and, and you know, and so if you if you look in the scene, I am looking at her appropriately with empathy and concern, and you know, it would have been a lot more interesting if I stifled. If you saw me laughing and trying to to not laugh in the context of the environment that I was in, I was not wanting to appear that way, right? And and even more so for film and TV, they cut it. You just be you and be truthful the whole time. And if it doesn't help them tell the story, they're going to get rid of it. But there's a chance that your, what you're doing that's so real and beautiful will help them tell the story. I just want to say a really quick thing that's connected to that. One of my favorite thing is this very famous, can people help me with the name of this editor? Walter. What is his name? Murdoch? Is that it? Walter Murdoch? Walter Murnick? He's a very famous editor. He was famous for, he edited uh, The English Patient. And I was reading about his work, and he says that one of the first things that he does when he gets the Walter Murch, thank you, Theodore, one of the first things that he does when he gets the dailies is that he cuts out all of the moments when the actors went up when they forgot their line, when a prop misbehaved, when they didn't know what they were doing, and he banks them, and he uses them as reaction shots. Because those are moments when the actors are being so truthful to what they're doing. And imagine the ways in which he was able to add depth and, uh, and honesty and vulnerability to people's performances by allowing that to be a part of it. And because he knows, and as the, the, what I said, sent to you in the mammoth is that it's all part of it. Is that it's all part of it, that we might think that we're fumbling the prop because I'm not good with props and I'm nervous, but who are you to say that that's what's happening? Maybe that that, that is the really, you are the character and that is the most articulate expression of what this character is feeling right now. So that's, that's my thought about that. Great. We have one more question from the Q&A tab, which is from Logan. And it's a, it reads, my experience of reading the two provided passages was one of striking similarity to Demidoff's methods and his struggles with his mentor Stanislavski's hyper-intellectual method. Is that Demidoff me a method of acting that you work from? No, it's not. And I have to say that I don't know enough about it. But, you know, one of the things that I really have found is, you know, I, I do feel that there's a similarity to, I remember the Stanislavski, you know, that he gets really frustrated with everybody in rehearsal one day and he's like, okay, stop saying your lines. Just, I mean, that's how I characterize it. That's not what it says in the book. But I imagine just everybody stop talking. And then he says, now I want you to go through and I just want you, without the words, I want you to embody the the thing and then it doesn't have and then it wasn't a pantomime and it didn't happen to make any sense if you want the person go to them and grab them if you are turning turn away and it remind and that reminds me of lindy davies exercise of taking the lines and putting them in your body and i do feel the things that i have gravitated to as an actor and that i have even if they didn't work for me the first time that i kind of persisted on are things that, like you pointed out, I saw echoes of in other practices that I felt like, oh, these things that are echoing that I see people through different exercises trying to grasp at this thing, it's, it would say to me like, oh, this must be it in a way. And so that's why I feel similarly that, you know, being truthful to yourself in the present, I'm like, that must be it, right? That must be when I'm lost that I can do that and it'll take me there. And also similarly, I feel to, to move my body and to move my body in a poetic, emotional way, that must also, that must be it also. 
So I, I agree with you. I don't know enough about it. So thank you for um, sending that to me so I can, I can read it. Great. And I'm curious if any of our lovely volunteers have any questions that they would like to ask. You can feel free to, yep, yeah, Julia, go for it. Hi, Julia. Uh, hi, Maria. Can you just uh, speak about what do you mean by poetic body? So I was just saying the poetic body as just a way to distinguish from the um, uh, pantom pantomime body, you know, who's going, Listen. you know, as, as this kind of like narrative, as like as kind of like narrative storytelling body. That's like, you know, that instead that that it's not exploring in that way, that it's exploring in right in this poetic of, of feeling that our emotional centers move us and that interacting with the script especially very early on in that way that it allows us to live truthfully when when we're just standing in the middle of the living room is my thought isabella hi um hi maria i have a question um there was in the reading there was something about memorizing and it said like do not try to memorize. Yeah. So I wonder if you have like any advice once you memorized or like once you're doing the show a couple of times, yeah. how to bring stuff that you like introduced into the body and into. Yes. Well, something that I like about both uh, Harold and Lindy Davy is that they are not precious about their work. There is no spell that has to be set in order for it to work on you. There is no right way to do it. So you can be working on a play for a very long time and you can feel like it's getting kind of stagnant for you and you can go back in and read it at home and do the Guskin and forget about everything that your partner is doing and just read the, and you can read it that way by yourself and you just read the other person's lines and you say, and you say that makes me, I'm feeling, you know, and allow the environment that you're in presently to inform you right? So that you are allowing yourself so that the, the Lindy Davies also is something that you can always drop in. And, and when I work, I constantly go back to her work. I always drop in again, because I find for me, sometimes what happens is something will live in my body, I'll express it. And then that's it, I expressed it. it is, it's not going to be there the next day. And so sometimes I have to go back in and investigate, especially with moments that feel to me, especially vulnerable or dangerous in some way. I kind of have to keep going back to them and finding myself in them again so that I feel like I have something new to share. Otherwise, I, I'll, get, I'll get stuck. So, uh, so those are two things. The other thing about is, I know ideally we don't memorize right away. Ideally, we're looking up the words and we're interacting and that we've done this stuff so much that the lines start to come to us. But I also know that that can happen all the time. You get an audition the day before and then it feels like it's very important for you to be off book and so you want to memorize the thing and similarly I will do a Guskin read the first time so that I'm not in that position of making a decision about the scene and deciding what it is so I'm just allowing myself to discover it but after I do a Guskin read I will memorize it and then I just go back in and do the Lindy Davies work that you did in preparation for moving today then I'll go look up all the words then I'll go lie on the floor and listen to the thing so that I have, you know? And so that's just a way that I feel like a modern actor who's treated a little bit like a robot, you know, tries to do the things that they want, but also have access to, you, to your humanity. And I found that I can have something memorized and go back in with the Lindy Davies and just let the things drop in and feel like, oh, it reminds me of a beach ball or, oh, this reminds me of, you know, sand or something like that. So. Great, Kate and then Julia. Hi, thank you so much for this. It's, uh, yeah, it's just amazing to like try to connect in this way. So thank you for offering us the space. It's so hard, oh good, I'm glad. Very, very moving, thank you. Um, so I found that as I worked on the uh, the scene with the, with the Lindy technique of dropping yeah. in, it, the, the the memorization or like the you know it's 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 not memorization so much as like memory yeah you know, and deepness right, right. Um, but there were so it came very quickly 
and naturally, but there were certain lines that didn't stick immediately. And I'm wondering if you have any insight as to, I know we're all different humans with different experiences, but when, when you find that happening as you work through your process, is that informative about anything about that line, about the character? Yeah, I think that the most important thing is to go back in with patience for yourself. And something that I always think of is I uh, studied Reiki and my Reiki teacher said something to me that also I was like, oh my gosh, that's so helpful for acting. It really has informed the way that I deal with myself as an actor. Is She said, you know, the first time you put your hands on yourself, sometimes it can just be uh, like stunning, you have the stunning experience and everything. And she's like, you know, and then another time you put your hands on yourself and nothing is happening. And she said, but who is to say that when you're putting your hands on yourself and nothing is happening, that that is not actually the more profound experience. That when you put your hands on yourself and the feeling comes up immediately of ecstasy or relief, that it was right there at the surface. And that maybe when you're putting your hands on yourself and nothing is coming, it's because something deeper is being stirred. And you have to have the patience to allow it to come to the surface. And so her saying that actually really changed my relationship to myself. When I used to have a feeling of like, I'm not feeling anything on stage, I used to go into like that mind thing of like punishing myself and being like, I don't have any emotions. I just want people to pay attention to me. There's actually nothing really going on up here. And I started to think instead in terms of the Reiki and say, I'm not feeling anything. I wonder if that's because this is actually calling up something very deep and, and painful and vulnerable. And I have to be gentle and I have to breathe and I have to trust myself. And I think, you know, just the experience of doing that makes for a more enjoyable experience on stage. And then you have both experiences. You have both. You have both where the very deep, intense thing does come to the surface and you have the experience where it's not ready yet. But I will say the experience where you're just breathing and allowing it to not be ready is much more truthful and pleasurable than it is to do the other thing. So that's my thought about that. Julia. Julia. Um, I actually did not quite know how to use the dictionary exercise because yeah. I looked up all the words that I found intriguing and then some of them looks like a simple word and they had like 20 definitions and I have to and some definitions it really take me a long time to understand what exactly are they trying to say so in a way I don't know if it's like after reading those yeah so, it's going to be there or do I need to understand what's going on for example yeah. here the word has like very long right totally you know I think that you allow your your interest to guide you allow you know if you read a whole bunch of definitions sometimes I think that is the thing to take away from it to be like, this, this is the word I'm picking. This word with all of these intents, right? That that could be the feeling behind it, right? Then other times there, there might be a definition that just uh, comes out to you. You know, for me, I asked you guys just as an example to look up like anger and, and radish. I, I don't know if anybody did, but, oh no, not radish, radical. Because for me, radical always meant um, like on the fringe. That's what I thought radical, like when I said the word radical, like that's what I meant and that's what I heard, radical is on the fringe. But then I looked it up and I saw that the root was rad, the Latin root rad, which is the same for radish, which means deep and root and underground. And it totally changed my idea of what radical meant when I said it in the play. I was, oh, radical. I was like, it means that we're digging it up out of the ground and we're from the roots, we're going to change it. We're not just going to cut the leaves. We're going to do. And so that really impacted instead of before it was like, I thought like radical, like on the fringe. And then I was like, Oh no, it's radical, a radical change. So, you know, sometimes you'll have an experience like that with a word where, and then it stayed with me. I think I, every time I said that word, I thought of dirt. I don't think I said that word once without thinking of dirt. And it really helped me a lot, but there are other words where, 
you know, it's not going to be there. The idea is not that we is not that we find a nugget with every single thing, but that we open ourselves to that process. And that maybe there are, I mean, I looked up all the words in that whole play, Rad, radical was the one, <laughs> you know, and so and maybe there's just one, maybe there's just one uh, nugget, but I, you know, that's not true that there, there are usually a bunch, <laughs> you know, and, and it's helpful just to have those images of what your character is trying to grasp at in order to express what's going on inside them. I just want to say one other thing. Is that all right? Taylor, I just want to say one other thing that I don't think that playwrights like it when I say this. <laughs> I, mean, I said to uh, my husband and he was like, hmm, he was a playwright. Um, but I think that it's a very helpful thing to think about as an actor is that I think about that plays are about the failure of language. And that really that we are feeling things and experiencing things and we are trying to find the words to communicate what it is that's going on inside us to other people. And that those words that the writer gives us, right, are they're, they're the best words that we have. They're not always the right words. Sometimes they're not enough. Sometimes they're too ornate. Right. And I, I just think it's a very helpful way to think of as an actor that it's the image, the thought and the feeling that come first for us in our experience. And then the language comes after. So don't tell any playwrights I said that. But I think it's a helpful position to be in as an actor. Kathleen, did I see a hand for you? Yeah, go for it. Um. I was curious in thinking about this, um, like, you know, doing these kinds of exercises and you, you do these things in school and, and all that stuff. And, and when you're in line, a rehearsal room, like you've had the script, you're supposed to be off book, all this stuff yeah. and sort of keeping it in the realm of, of keeping, uh, I guess any sort of like tips, uh, in, in keeping that work towards, um, bringing up the feeling of just whatever is there for yeah. that day as I opposed to with like, like sometimes because people sometimes it'll be like a director will be like why was that different today or that sort of uh, thing that you might encounter right yes I, I I totally I I totally agree with you what I do like about these two exercises and why I shared them with you is that I think that or I, my experience has been that the more th that these are the things that I can do when I'm home. So if I go in rehearsal and I have this whole thing and I'm like, oh, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And then I can come in and I can record my lines into my voice app and I can move around. And I have done that to try to figure things out, right, about what I'm feeling. Um, and with the Guskin, I can come home and I can read that. And what I like about these exercises, other than just being tools to get into the script, the more you do them, the more the muscle, you, the more you build the muscle for trusting yourself and for allowing whatever it is that you are experiencing to inform the line. Because the more you do it, the more you have the feeling of, wow, I started from frustration and not knowing what I was doing. And I ended up in such a full, joyful place. And so you, when you give yourself the permission to do this, you will have all these journeys by yourself where you begin to see, oh, when I leave myself alone and I trust myself, that these things can happen. And so that the more, so in I, for me in, in doing these exercises, the more I do them, what they actually are is they're preparing you to be in the moment. They're preparing you to then do that very thing and to have the experience. What I like about these exercises, is I do feel that sometimes I feel as, an, as artists, you, you know, our anxiety or our desire to please uh, separates us from ourself. And it's such a, for me, it's such a painful experience of betrayal to our, to myself when I feel that I, I have a, a feeling or a thought that I'm unable to express truthfully. And I think that these two exercises uh, reunite uh, ourselves with our creative self when we feel like it might have been uh, ruptured. So then too, so that's the first part of the thing. The second thing is you're saying when a director says to you, uh, how come you do it the way you did the other time? You know, 
I, I think a couple of things about that. I think, uh, you know, the director wants to tell the story and sometimes they get a little confused about what the story is. You know, they're also trying to figure out what the story is. And sometimes they like, you did something that was very interesting and exciting and that became like a flagpole for them. But that, that's really actually not the flagpole. Right, it's just standing in place for a while. And so sometimes, so you can have a very honest conversation with a director and say, you know, like I had that experience one time, but I just really wanna continue, you know, finding out what this is for me. You know, and that, because just that will calm a, a director down and to know that you're not just going rogue. It's like the recognition of that thing. Um, the other thing is that you can repeat what I like about the, the Lindy Davies work is that you can repeat things and they can be different. So you can think radish, does that make sense? And different things will come out. And I think that your only obligation as an actor is to connect with that thing truthfully. It's not to flail your arms and throw yourself back on the bed the way you're supposed to. Um, and now that just leads me to one last thought that I have is that when you know your character so well, right? When you know and you trust yourself and the character so well, you can actually do anything, you know? It's, in, it's when we're in those early stages, when we're figuring out what the play is about at the same time that the director is figuring out what the play is about, everything seems like it matters. Like I walk to the table and the director says, don't walk to the table anymore. But you're like, that's not how, that's, I walk to the table. That's the, most, that's the only thing I know about my character is she likes that table. But if you go home and do this work, you know your character in an intimate way, right? That they can hang upside down and still have their thoughts and feelings. Does that make sense? So in a way, I actually feel that doing this work makes you a better collaborator because you keep going inside and finding out where you live in the text and finding out where it lives in you, right? That then you can do it anywhere the way I can be myself here, I can be myself, you know, uh, in a store with a mask on <laughs> and, you know, I can be myself hanging upside down. D d does that make sense? And because there's a, a confidence in, in the relationship. And so I think that these two act exercises help us to build that confidence with ourselves that our character is not just the things that they do, you know? Those are my, that's my scattergram response to that very complicated and good question. <laughs> we have two last questions from our attendees to close us out, but I'll ask you, Maria. The, the first one is a question regarding emotions, um, you know, because this person knows it's maybe more about the fight in the scene and not about who can cry, but sometimes it can feel overwhelming that pressure to emote. So yeah. the question is, how do you create a balance with a heavy emotional life? Right. It was, well, one of my favorite things is uh, I studied really early on with Bill Esper, and he said that you cannot choreograph emotion, which uh, is another thing that I've really carried with me all the time, that you can't choreograph emotion. And that really the best chance that you have is to be truthful to yourself in the moment, I know that I keep repeating that. But uh, when I started trusting that and doing it, I just had all of these experiences that then start to support it, right? So at first it's just something that somebody says to you. And then when you start to little by little find the bravery to do that, uh, right? To feel like you're in the scene, in the love scene where you know you're supposed to be vulnerable and then you're gonna get married and you're gonna cry. If you're actually angry with your scene partner because he's not looking at you, be angry. And then actually the anger, then it will flow and it'll move and then something else will come in. And to trust that that will happen. And the only way that you, we can do that actually is through experience. I, I can say it to you, but to trust that, um, and, and I will say one thing is that, you know, the, the, we can make ourselves cry, right? And we, we know what that looks like. And there was just, a, I will say I'm in constant relationship with it, right? I, I won't say that I'm like, I fixed it and I don't deal with that anymore. You're in constant relationship with the thing. But, I, but in that constant relationship where you say to yourself, 
you know, I, I know what this thing is and I know what it's going to look like and it'll be fine, but it's never going to be more than fine. But the other thing has so much possibility in it. And if we can engage in the other thing, we, there'll be more life there. And that, you know, they wrote cry in the script, but that's because they want when people to read it, they want them to have a picture in their head, right? To define, now they have you, they don't need to have that picture in the head anymore. And so now maybe you just feeling your sorrow and breathing through it, and maybe it's not cracking your face open, but that will be, that is, it's enough. You know, that it's enough. And, you know, I have to say, I really understand even more how it's enough because I've been working with actors over Zoom now since March. And, you know, you're all the size of a quarter. Like, everybody's like this big. And I can feel people. I really can. You know, I have like a, like I have an audience response when I see people working. I can tell when someone's in alignment with themselves. And it's not because they're, and I feel moved by seeing someone in alignment with them, with themselves. It's not because they're doing a thing, you know, and that's really made me understand even more that, um, you know, that, that, that's a, it's a very, it's a perceptible thing. It's a real perceptible thing. And it's, a, and that's the thing that is moving to an audience is a person who is allowing themselves to be seen in whatever state they're in allowing themselves to be seen. So I would say, if you're feeling the pressure, I know easier said than done, but just keep breathing and look at your, uh, and look at your partner. There is one other Lindy Davies exercise that's very helpful because I love Lindy because she really, you know, you say, look at the other person and it's like, I don't know, I'm looking at them, you know, and nothing's happening. So what Lindy talks about is to begin to talk to yourself in the third person. And so you're looking at the other person and you say, a woman sees a screen, a woman sees a little red microphone with a line through it. A woman sees a shadow on a white wall. A woman sees a very hard angle. That in doing that, we get out of the self-conscious and we get ourselves into the present. And that we get into that place where instead of having a hardness, right, of blinders on, of like, I'm going and I'm looking for these things, there's a softening where we can be more available to things. It's, it's a great thing to do for a close-up. It's a great thing to do when you're on stage all by yourself, when you're the first person who comes out and you have to find your keys. It's a really nice thing to do when you find yourself, instead of saying to yourself, oh, I'm supposed to be, I was outside and now I'm inside. You know, instead it's just nice to sit there and say, a woman gets her purse, a woman looks at her purse, a woman sees a paper, a woman hopes that the stage manager put the keys inside. The stage manager did put the keys inside. The woman, you know, and there you are. It's so nice. It's my favorite thing to do. Thank you for that. And our very last question in our last few, minutes, moments, is do you have any specific process for after you finish a scene and you're assessing what happened when you gave over to your environment, especially when the scene goes drastically different from maybe what you're used to? Yes, you know, I think that when I really have, and I find that, some, you know, it's a push and pull. I find that something is like give over and then come back and then give over again and then come back. There's sometimes there are very glorious experiences when I gave over the whole time. You know, the, I, I'm not evaluating it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not evaluating it then. It's the most wonderful experience to be like, I don't know what the hell happened out there. Uh, it, it's, it's great. So you trust that you don't know what happened and that you were in it because you were in it and you were doing the thing and you were hearing and feeling the audience and you know, you weren't in a psychotic state where you're just doing stuff and the audience is like, what's going on? You know, you, you were in a place where actually you were sharing yourself, right? And sharing, so that's why you don't have that perspective anymore of what was I doing. You know, um, I remember when I was really, really young, I read this article in Vanity Fair about of all actors, who's that guy? Uh, wasp. He, he calls himself a fuzzy wasp, John Lithgow. And it was an interview with John Lithgow when I was like a 17 year old reading it in Vanity Fair. And they said, how do you know when you've had a good performance? And he says, when I came off stage and I have no idea what I've done. 
And I read that and I was like, that was weird, but it stayed in my head the whole time. And little by little, I started to understand what he meant. And I actually, that's the feeling I want, like the feeling when you have an improv and you're like, what the hell? I don't even know where we started and what, you don't have to evaluate it. There are other people who are evaluating it, believe me, you know, and they'll, they'll tell you. And what, what I mean to say is, it's not so weird, but you actually become a better collaborator when you're working that way. You're, instead of being somebody who is like, I don't know, they just go, they do whatever they want. I can't, I can't talk to her. Instead, it's actually because you're allowing yourself to express yourself, it gives you more room to listen to other people. And it's a lot easier when you are in a nice relationship with yourself and somebody is like, you have to put that cup down after that line. It's actually a lot easier to hear that because you're allowing yourself. It's when we are in, it's when we're in the place of like, look, I'm watching myself like a fucking hawk. I got to say this line like this. I got to do this like this. And then on top of it, you want me to get the cup down? That's when it's hard. It's actually that being in that, being in that accepting whatever happens, I trust myself space makes you actually a, a much better collaborator. Thank you. Oh my goodness, Maria, thank you so much for this. Thank you, really thank everybody for going along with me. Um, and really, I didn't know how this, that second exercise was going to do go and you made it really beautiful. So I really, uh, I'm, I'm so grateful to all of you for giving so much of yourself and, and making that beautiful exercise. I really loved experiencing that with you. Yes, ditto. Thank you to all these wonderful volunteers, to Maria, to everybody watching. As we sign off, um, I just want to share a few upcoming events. On Wednesday, October 14th at 11.30 a.m., we have a fireside chat with Sea Lighting Foundation. We have our open mic night on Thursday, October 22nd at 7 p.m. with Poetic Theater Productions. You can find the full list of upcoming programming on our website, mytw.org. All past master classes and fireside chats are also available for viewing at mytw.org. We're gonna post a link to a short survey about today's class in the comments on Zoom and on Facebook. Please take a moment and share your thoughts with us. And again, if you're in the position to do so, we hope you would consider making a donation in honor of this class to Equality for Flatbush and also to MYTW to support ongoing programming. Thank you everybody so much. Such a pleasure to be in this virtual space with you. And I hope we're in a real space together very soon. Bye, everybody.